case you confused it with the Easter Bridge in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Capitan. Here you are, folks, the backstory you never knew you wanted or needed. Coming this fall, follow the formative follicular follies of the world's foremost lip foliage in Poirot's mustache roots. Il y a une autre solution, Capitaine. For sure, you could hire a different actor to play young Poirot instead of using this creepy eye CGI bullshit. Vous aviez raison! Vous avez l'esprit bien trop aiguisé pour un fermier, Poirot! Poirot's plan here is so brilliant that a mission where everyone was guaranteed to die becomes one with zero friendly casualties. I feel like this kind of an extreme turnaround should probably depend on more than a favorable wind and a bit of ornithology. Oh, How does Poirot suddenly notice this tripwire? He doesn't change position while the captain is praising him, so did he already know it was there and only decide to mention it at the last possible second? Do you have any idea how love works? Nope. Skip! What about this? Simple. You'll grow a moustache. Holy sh**, this flashback really was just to give us an origin for Poirot's moustache, wasn't it? Also, since scar tissue does not have follicles, hair cannot grow from it. Therefore, the fact that he has these scars means he couldn't have as full of a moustache as he eventually grows. Also, also, and more frustratingly, this opening tells us little to nothing about how Poirot became a great detective. It is literally seven minutes about why he has a moustache and who inspired it. Look, movie, if Agatha f***ing Christie didn't care, then why should I? Poirot, where you been? Name a real-life detective. Now, think of one that would be famous enough to get this level of attention. If you can, you're a liar, and this movie still gets a sin. Monsieur Poirot, you solved the case in Egypt. The last movie ended with some guy telling Poirot he was needed in Egypt, specifically for a murder on the Nile. But this greeting suggests he's finished that case, so does that mean it wasn't the death on the Nile? But just a death on the Nile? There's no music because no money's been paid. I pay everyone at the end of the night. Isn't that the sort of thing you agree on before the entertainment is due to start? I think her aunt needs a new agent. We will now be subjected to two full minutes of 30s-style, sexy, jazzy, seducy, dancy shenanigans instead of the murder mystery I've been promised. It's fine, I can wait. I'm sure it won't take as long as the last movie did to get to the murder. The people behind this film have clearly never been to a club while the music is playing. The idea that this many people would part like the Red Sea for Lynette is ludicrous. Half the audience is either too drunk or high to even notice anyone is around them. There would be so many sweaty people bumping into her, she'd probably leave the dance floor pregnant. We have it. There are seven. Indeed, seven of the very finest, sir. I do not want seven, I want only the six. Don't care how OCD you are, getting rid of any dessert is a sin. Dessert shadowing! Honestly, I'll die if I can't be Mrs. Doyle. More foreshadowing! Look, I could get through a lot of these, so let's just add ten sins now for all the overt winking and nodding. It is an insane coincidence that Poirot just happens to be in the club while all this is happening. Yes, he's here to investigate the Otterborns, and they're closely linked to Lynette. But that doesn't make it any less ludicrous that he chooses this night, the night where Jackie and Simon's murder plot all begins, to be here. Eccentric he may be, but what kind of lunatic eats their Jaffa cake before their boiled eggs? And where did the eggs even come from? Is he just carrying them around in his pocket in the middle of an Egyptian desert? You are defiling one of the wonders of the world! And also, by the way, ruining a sublime Jaffa cake! No, you ruined the Jaffa cake when you threw it on the ground. Who's supposed to be the detective around here anyway? Also, does he really expect whoever this is to be able to hear him from all the way down here? Of all the pyramids in all the world, you had to walk up to mine. We eventually find out that this wasn't a coincidence at all, and Poirot has been hired by Book's mother to investigate his new girlfriend. But if this meeting was deliberate, it makes the preceding Jaffa cake sacrifice and following exclamations even more baffling. And for whose benefit? And now a veritable assortment of assailants shall assemble, all saying fascinatingly specific and suspicious things and being generally sketchy in ways that only people in murder mysteries would ever choose to be. It's bad enough we have to stay in this bourgeois nightmare of a hotel. Having Jennifer Saunders staying in a hotel that isn't absolutely fabulous. I am calm, capable, and coping. Discount Russell Bro- Oh, holy sh- Is it very expensive? I don't know, Mr. Nosy McNoserson. Pretty sure your job is to just show people through their lockboxes and take messages for them while they're out doing rich people stuff. Having opinions on their things for safekeeping is not in the job description. Scene does not contain anyone eating breakfast. Please welcome the newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. Simon Doyle. So Poirot just happens to be investigating Book while he's celebrating the marriage of two people that he observed dancing together six weeks ago and across the world in London? And Poirot never figures out he's in a movie? Fancy finding the one heiress without adenoids and flat feet. After Book's fun introduction into the film, I was thinking I'm going to be really sad when he's eventually killed, but after this comment, I'm good. I was sure Book was fibbing when he said he knew the Hercule Poirot. Why does everybody know this f***ing guy? I mean, maybe you'd remember the name if it was mentioned, but you just know him by sight? I don't f***ing believe you, Lynette. Friends, I know you're all thinking there's a mystery at play here. 
Sadly, we're still over 30 minutes away from any kind of mystery, and considering how easy it is to solve, we might be an entire movie away. Also, wedding speeches. If I were in his shoes, I'd only come here to put a bullet in the groom. Book continues to introduce the rest of the guests by describing their various motives for killing Lynette, as if she's already dead. Which is weird, because, well, she isn't. She's followed us again. This private party for the richest of the rich apparently has zero security, which is especially odd considering Jackie has been stalking them for quite some time now. He's here. Who is? Well, well. He was also there yesterday, so not sure why Lynette and Simon had to wait till the next day to ask for his help other than the movie needed a scene change. Yes. <laughs> this is the strangest Poirot flex I've ever seen. What has his quick reflexes with his cane got to do with anything? This wasn't an attempt on Lynette's life. This is literally the movie just slapping us in the face with Poirot's impressive shaft skills. There is no case for me to accept she has committed no crime. And even if Jackie had made legit threats to Simon and Lynette, why would they think Poirot would be someone that could help them? If they know who he is, then they know the types of cases he takes on, and his cases never revolve around him talking to someone who is making threats to his clients. This is just as weird as Edward Ratchet and Murder on the Orient Express wanting to hire Poirot as a bodyguard. When thinking back, I don't think we sinned that, and we should have, so here's two sins for good measure. I could have punched the sun. Hmm. Instead, you broke your engagement. Hercule Poirot would solve all the murders at CinemaSins. And you might ask, how many murders are there at CinemaSins HQ? And my answer is more than... <laughs> it's a 22 caliber. It's practically a toy. Since we find out Jackie and Simon are putting on a ruse so they can murder Lynette and get her money, I can't figure out what the f*** Jackie is up to in this scene with Poirot. Is making yourself the most obvious suspect a good idea in front of the world's greatest detective? They had no way of knowing that Poirot would even be here when they had originally planned this, so they couldn't have set all this up from the get-go. Nor did they know Poirot would go talk to Jackie, and he even turned down Simon and Lynette's offer, so why he's talking to Jackie is equally as confusing. Why is this scene? Also, even if all of the above did happen to plan, wouldn't Poirot not think it's slightly odd that the person with the greatest motive for murder would so willingly show a fucking detective the weapon with which they possibly plan to do the murdering? Does he really believe someone would be that careless? Shouldn't he have figured out that he was being deliberately misled here? What would you have us do? Try the police? I'm sure Mrs. Doyle has a fine home. Go to it now. How did Simon and Jackie know that Poirot wouldn't report this to the police anyway? Jackie has all but admitted that she plans to kill Annette, so why wouldn't he report her? I know, for reasons, Simon and Jackie are doing this to move the party and the eventual murder to the Karnak. But there has got to be an easier way to pull this off. Also, why doesn't Poirot report Jackie to the police? Much like the first movie, the murderers have decided the best place to execute their plan is in a confined space with the world's most famous detective, who at least one of them has invited to be here. And enough champagne to fill the Nile. <laughs> I'm assuming a second bottle of champagne was simultaneously being opened with a fucking gun because there's no way that wasn't the sound of a damn gunshot. Also, on average, 24 people die every year from the explosive release of champagne cork, so I'm left wondering why Simon and Jackie didn't try that route. A rogue cork to the temple is far more likely than the elaborate bullshit they try to get away with here. It's not even half ten. Then we're behind. Day drinking. In case you weren't already aware, the movie lines up absolutely everyone it wants you to suspect of the eventual murder, which I'm presuming is going to be soon, right? Thankfully, the movie wastes time showing us Louise attempting to get everyone's luggage. How would we have ever made it through the film not knowing how the character's luggage magically appeared on board the ship? Also, that appears to be the exact same boat they transported all the people to the ship on. How many trips will poor Louise have to make to get all this luggage transported? So the sin, as always, is being a dick to your assistants. I'm not getting paid to have the sole job of writing down the shuffleboard scores in this scene. Well, that's some borderline, surely. Huh? What's that? What's that? Cheating! Also, this maneuver really only works if you pull it off before your opponent has already seen where the puck has landed. Due to COVID and probably budgetary reasons, I understand this movie couldn't be shot on location in Egypt, but adding in looking CGI crocodiles only adds to the falseness of the background scenery and takes me right out of the movie. F*** this crocodile. Not me. That's not my way. I've never read a contract in my life. Suddenly, Army Hammer's alleged new career in the Caymans makes so much more sense. She's never cared for anyone I've ever brought home. Unless it was clear that they were only staying the night. So, Book's mother doesn't approve of long-lasting relationships built on love, but she's cool with her son having as many one-night stands as he pleases? Honestly can't decide if that makes her the worst mother ever or the coolest. Ramesses II, married to Nefertari, first and favorite of his eight wives. 46 minutes in, and our murder mystery has time for a history lesson on ancient Egypt, but doesn't deem it necessary to make space for an actual murder. You want my blessing? to marry that girl when well, you can't have it. Who was watching Murder on the Orient Express and thinking, man, I hope we get to learn more about Book in the next film. Maybe even meet his mother. No one. No one was thinking that. No more hiding. <laughs> we'll make it on our own. They will not. I 
hope to perfect a new strain of the vegetable marrows. Veggie table. You do realize we've barely had hands past Cairo. Goddamn, this is the horniest Agatha Christie adaptation I've ever seen. I'm no prude, and it's not like Christie refrained from writing about her characters fooling around, but I don't recall any of her stories being this Fifty Shades of Grey before. Where is my serpent of old Nile? Holy sh! the 1930s took edging way more literally than I would have anticipated. We're gonna find out that Cousin Andrew was the one who tried to kill Lynette, so how did he get down here so fast after being at the top of the cliff just a few seconds ago? Purposely placing yourself in the one spot on the ship that will give you the most dramatic reveal when you are discovered. I want her off the ship now! She already had a ticket to board here! Put her head! But how? Lynette has the means to rent out the entire ship and gave the impression earlier she had, so why didn't she just do that? Just tell me what it costs to get her away from me! Name a price! I'll buy the whole damn boat if I have to. And yet no boats are bought or even left, and Lynette instead decides to have fucking dinner with everyone as if all is well. I'm honestly beginning to wonder if she's in on the murder too. If it ever fucking happens, that is. One last cork, though. Why not? I do not normally take alcohol. But I'll make an exception because the movie needs me to be drugged and unconscious for the next six to eight hours. Oh, we've already made love today. Twice. Three times. Sir, I would not brag about that third time if she's only counting two. Where did this newspaper come from? Since these are pictures from the night Lynette and Simon met, this would have to be at least a few months ago. Why would this old issue be on board the ship? I swear, looking at you now makes all the fond memories go sour. There's so much overacting in this scene, it almost feels like the fight is staged. Can you imagine? There's no way this mystery is that easy to guess, right? Right? Rosalie, stay there. I will find Nurse Bowers. Simon and Jackie get extremely lucky that Windlesham doesn't go immediately to the parlor and tend to Simon's wound. Simon would never have time to pull off the murder and shooting himself if Windlesham doesn't take a minute to get his sh together in his room. We do find out eventually that Book discovered Lynette was dead before anyone else. But it's ridiculous that not a single other person went to check on Lynette after Simon was shot or inquired about whether or not she knew. Also, the movie takes one hour, four minutes, and 38 seconds to properly death on the knot. Also, also, what is the point of this gradual focus shot? Even if this story wasn't almost 100 years old, who the f else was this really going to be? A mysterious case of the vanishing pistol. Someone locates it in the moments between you bringing Mr. Doyle to the doctor and your return. So that should take Poirot straight to Simon, since he was the only person that was ever left alone in the room with the gun, right? Makes me wonder what the next 50 minutes will be about, but I suppose there are a few corners of Egypt we haven't seen yet. <laughs> Acting! She has a complete alibi for the entire night from the moment she fired her gun at you. I mean, isn't that pretty suspicious in and of itself? Jackie, the person with the greatest motive, manages to manufacture an airtight alibi on the night Lynette is killed. Okay, maybe she isn't the number one suspect, but throughout the course of the movie, Poirot doesn't question or confront her until the reveal at the very end. Also, how did Jackie know she would be taken into a room and given a knockout drug to further maintain that alibi? You have to find out who killed my wife. I get that Simon is arrogant, but how goddamn stupid is it that Simon puts Poirot on the trail to find out his and Jackie's scheme? Simon and Jackie have pulled off the charade successfully for months now, and after the murder, they make the dumbest fucking decisions until they are caught. As we watch the boat staff turn everyone's cabins upside down to find the necklace, I have to wonder why the police aren't here. I know they can't move the boat while they're searching for the gun, but can't the police come to them? Isn't a murder worthy of immediate police attention? Also, we will find out Book took the necklace and eventually plants it in his mom's room to divert suspicion. So I guess maybe he has it on him at this point? But why isn't anyone getting a pat down? At least make them empty their pockets? I believe Poirot is a brilliant man, but he makes some seriously dumb mistakes in this film that make him seem less brilliant than he should be. I can appreciate that murder mysteries have to do their best to make the interrogation scenes visually interesting, but whoever decided on this panning and circles camera movement deserves to have all my vomit on their shoes. If I wanted to kill her, I would have used this. 45. I fail to see how possession of a bigger gun proves his innocence. Why would he use his own gun in a murder anyway? I'm not one to look down on fashion choices, but it's really noticeable that Book is wearing this large jacket and no one else is wearing one. And considering the color of the coat and the coat itself becomes so important in Poirot's investigation, it also seems extremely convenient. You could say it's a coat of convenience. I'll leave now. He wants to speak with me. I'm laying down a corner. Jesus Christ, what kind of psychopath gets this far into a puzzle without finishing the edges first? She did it! She's the murderer! The beds made every day, sheets folded in marvelously precise 45 degree hospital corners, I must say. Poirot is about to deduce that Marie and Bowers are lovers by noticing the way Bowers' bed was made up. I'm not sure if I'm impressed, offended, or bored. Probably a little of all three. Also, I know Poirot wants to get to the bottom of the murder, but did he really have to out them in front of Book? 
They're obviously keeping it a secret for good reason, and I don't think that Faro actually believes either of them did it based on the tiny amount of evidence he has so far. They found something? This quickly? In the goddamn Nile? Your scuff, complete with bullet holes. Used to dampen the noise of a shot. That thin-ass piece of fabric wouldn't dampen the noise of a Nerf dart, let alone a damn gunshot. Why would my mother murder Lynette? Great question. One that Perot gives some fluffy answer about it being revenge for Lynette introducing Rosalie to Book. Putting aside the fact that murdering someone for setting up your son is a touch on the extreme side, why would Book's mother also hire Poirot to be there at the same time that she commits the murder? And I believe that at least two of our marriages were not, I think, strictly legally ended, but she is a magnificent personality. The power of boners, man. Apparently enough to make Poirot gloss over a double homicide. She might have offered her silence for a sum of money, a blackmail. Holy sh! Simon gets phenomenally lucky that the person who witnessed him murder Lynette was in great need of money and had been recently wronged by Lynette enough to not give a sh that her murderer gets away with it. Well, you'd better try harder. Or we'll all wind up in an Egyptian jail cell. How is that gonna happen? Does she think the Egyptian police will just assume they all did it and lock them all up? I have one final interview to conduct. Once again, Poirot fails to suspect or interview any of the damn crew that works on the boat. Yes, they weren't technically supposed to be on the boat at the time of Lynette's death, but there's no reason to believe one or more of them didn't stay behind, right? I'm a suspect now. How long did you know Lynette? I know your tricks. I've seen this play before from that side of the table. If Book knows Poirot so well, he really shouldn't be surprised that he's being interviewed. He especially shouldn't mind since he knows he didn't kill Lynette. Why did you not wake Lynette when Simon was shot? We've already covered this and sent it, Poirot. In fact, I'm sending it again, since it took so long for you to find an answer to the most obvious question. But you came upon Louise Bourget arguing with someone, demanding money. You saw her throat cut, but you could not say no without admitting you stole. Why would Book have needed to admit he stole the necklace just because he saw Louise get killed? He could easily have hid the necklace, or tossed the necklace aside, or either tackled Louise's murderer, or told Poirot about it. Hell, he could have been really devious and just planted the necklace on Louise and then sounded the alarm. Mon ami Book, huh? Movie makes a couple of terrible decisions in this scene. For one thing, it kills off Book, who in just two movies has become a really fun partner of Poirot's. This is a character they brought back even though he's not in the source material, and then just wastes him like this. And another thing is, you've turned Book into a thieving asshole who knew the identity of Louise's murder but didn't say anything and risked the lives of everyone else on the ship because he was mad at his mom. A hooded figure runs away after killing someone, and I have to ask, when did this turn into Agatha Christie's scream? Also, why is Jackie running away from Poirot when she could just as easily turn around and shoot him, and she and Simon probably get away scot-free? Poirot is just a few paces behind the killer here, and yet when he comes through this door, they have completely vanished, as if they knew the movie still had 20 minutes left. Doing as he did at the temple of Abu Simbul, where he wandered off alone, desperate. It's insane how even though Simon and Jackie had concocted this complex plan to snuff out Lynette, they almost didn't have to because Cousin Andrew just happened to be thinking of doing the same thing for a moment, not to mention Book's sudden theft impulse taking Poirot even further off track in his investigation. It's crazy to think that a sequel following a film that had included 12 different people stabbing the same person still ends up being the more ludicrously plotted of the two. Hoping to hide his sins under a rock. I don't know what I was thinking. I really don't understand why Cousin Andrew is even admitting to this, let alone why he did it in the first place. Nobody saw him push the boulder. No one can even prove it wasn't a freak accident. All this does is make him look guilty as all hell. Also, how has Poirot figured this out? He can't just be basing it on the fact that Andrew wandered off alone, can he? Poirot was occupied with Salome for most of that time, so how does he know where everyone was? And even if that was enough evidence, it means Poirot knew all along and either failed to bring it up or chose not to when all the murdering started. Also, also, why does it even f***ing matter? Why is Poirot bringing this up now when he knows that Andrew didn't do it? Other than to tie up a plot point for the audience, of course. He doesn't even tell the police about Andrew when they leave the boat. I didn't kill her. I would never do that. Except for that time when you attempted to drop a huge boulder on her head, of course. Busy with Jackie and finding the doctor. This gives the murderer, but moments alone, moments are all he needs. Okay, this gives Simon the time he needs, but he still had to rely on no one spotting him making the trip from the bar to Lynette's room and back again. Something he has no way of guaranteeing and is actually made even more unlikely after the commotion that he and Jackie have deliberately created. What they did here was sound a huge alarm and then commit a murder. To retrieve the scarf which he had previously hidden where he took the gun one more time and filed it into his own leg. Once again, I say, there is no way that this wisp of material is muffling jack sh from the people on high alert a few doors down. And if it's that crucial, why didn't everyone hear the unmuffled shot that killed Lynette? This story seems to completely disregard how f***ing loud gunshots are. Jacqueline de Belfort. 
Why is everyone shocked by this? If Simon wasn't really shot the first time, and Jackie was the one firing the gun with a blanket, and it seems like a logical conclusion that she's in on this. In those same mysterious waters, carmine red paint will fade to pink. This goes to prove that Simon had faked the initial shot to his knee, but this makes me wonder why Poirot has waited until now to do the big reveal. In fact, he didn't even need to interview Book. All that did was confirm who stole and returned the necklace. Poirot has had all the evidence that points toward Jackie and Simon since he found the paint was missing and the gun was recovered from the Nile, which for us was almost 40 goddamn minutes ago. You never cared for money. But you could deny him nothing, not even a plan when he could not devise his own. This plan involves Jackie being okay with Simon seducing, sleeping with, and marrying another woman. A woman that's supposed to be her best friend. A plan which completely goes to shit if Lynette doesn't immediately fall in love with Simon. A man who is currently engaged to her best friend and is of questionable social standing. This is not a good plan. Also, how are they ever going to get away with this? They barely bothered to frame anyone else for the murder. He just invited a bunch of sketchy people on board and hoped one of them would be dumb enough to take the fall. In fact, their method gave at least two of the guests pretty solid alibis. <laughs> Holy sh**, she just kills them both? Okay, Poirot has a great reputation, but even so, the case here is pretty weak. There are still no eyewitnesses to any of the murders. Forensics doesn't really exist yet, so all that's really stacked against them is a handkerchief that's stained a slightly lighter color than one would expect. There's a solid chance they'd still get away with this sh**. You will arrest me now? No. So long as you settle her affairs honestly and pay back what you owe. At the end of the Orient Express, Poirot tortured himself about the morality of not reporting everyone to the police. But now he's happy to let the dude that committed attempted murder walk away because he can guarantee everyone gets the money they're owed? So I guess everyone just happened to bring appropriate morning attire with them in case of tragic murders? And now for a two minute prologue literally dedicated to Poirot's top lip, which has received more character development than most MCU villains. You've been very cold and unsupportive of our dreams. You wrecked my fucking boat, you goon! I'm staying for the French. Are you my mummy? I heard there was a wounded soldier whose instincts on the battlefield saved his entire company. The only good thing about being wounded in the buttocks is the ice cream. The spice exists on only one planet in the entire universe. A desolate, dry planet with vast deserts. You are a sad, strange little man, and you have my pity. Not the first time I've heard this. Who are the guests? There you got your motorheads. Car jocks, all the world's a gasket and a lube job and a pack of luckies. Music of choice, posi traction, overdrive, classic rock, skin of the almonds, Bruce, drug of choice, beer, Miller genuine draft. Keggers can't be choosers. No more foreplay. Why are you walking like that? Because I got shot in the ass, Suzanne! What did you do last night after you left Miss Lynette? You know nothing, Jen Snow. And Dr. Windlesham travels widely, hmm? India, Africa. Uh, I traveled here on a iron bird. An airplane. 